I am so excited, I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control, and I think I like it. Um, and all honestly, this is this is one of the biggest risks I have ever had to do with this podcast. Um, I have never done something this uh, uh, out of my element before, so I am so ready for this. I'm so glad I'm doing it with you, partner. Hey, David, what are we doing today? <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to Back to the Classics movie, uh, the cinematic movie podcast. Takes you back to the iconic films of 20 years ago. I am your host, Angel Neff, and with me is, of course, my guy for this month. It is Lon Hairston. He is back. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I'm, dig I'm digging the red. Uh, I'm digging the red curtain you got. You got oh yeah. Uh, I had to move my secret location to somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, this show will be a little bit longer because for the first time in the history of Back to the Classics, we will be doing a double feature. We are actually going to be doing two movies uh, this time. Luckily, both movies are only 90 minutes long. Um, so we will be doing uh, a That Guy, That Girl Award, which is kind of weird with this movie because you can eat, because when it comes to that chick, I really feel like there's only one that chick that really nails it. Um, the others are just kind of like, hey, we're there, we're the tag moms, right? Um, uh, but we're going to be doing this twice. We'll be cutting this in half. I, as you know, there's a theme when it comes to London and I. We always do Keanu Reeves or Patrick Swayze flicks. And this time, <laughs> We're taking this back to both 1989 and 1991 with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. That's I'm right. So I am so <laughs> for this. Um, Let me ask before we really get started into this, how was your week? Uh, okay, I guess. <laughs> Anything really interesting happen? Nope, just continuing to traverse the hellscape that is this year. Yes, yes. <laughs> Posted a meme today of Chappelle show with uh, with uh, Rick James, you know, saying "fuck your couch." You know, <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly how 2020 is. It's just some dude stepping all over you. Hey, I get to watch Bill and Ted, so right, exactly. It's Not funny because, because I watched this. Uh, I watched Excellent Adventure last night, and then first thing when I walked into work this morning, I, I watched Bogus Journey, which I know that makes me seem really bad, but I know Bogus Journey a lot better than I know Excellent Adventure. Yeah. Um, so it kind of, so I, I was just kind of able to kind of skim through it because I love Bogus Journey. I have to uh, say, I think out of the two, Bogus Journey has a lot more meat to it. I think so too. I think I think Bogus Journey is like one of those that that it, it decided to say, you know what, we're gonna make a sequel, but this sequel it the only thing that kind of ties this sequel to the first movie is that hey, we're gonna mention that we did a history paper, but <laughs> like like right. that's it. That's all we're gonna say that we did a history sure. paper. Sure. I mean Bogus Journey starts the movie literally starts in the future. Right, they, you know, time travel to the past in the phone booth. So there, there you go. That's also, I mean, Bill and Ted are in the movie still. <laughs> so what is it about these? Uh, I, I always, I always feel like that Keanu is like the ultimate bro when it comes to, to these movies. And I just feel like he'd be that way in real life anyway. Um, because as much as we talked about Point Break, and I and you know where my feelings are over Point Break, um, Bill and Ted was kind of like that first little glimpse into this bro ship with Alex Winter to kind of come in and just kind of and just kind of you know kind of do its own uh, own little thing. What is yeah. it with Keanu in that? I don't know. I mean, I I don't know if it's like his first movie, but I know that's the first movie I've seen with Keanu. It's like the first movie I remember him being in, and it just seems like. Yeah, you know, it's just like the movies are really fun. They're kind of lighthearted, like Bill and Ted. They're kind of, you know, they're kind of dummies, but they're good-natured. And 
You know, I, I find it hilarious because if you if you look at like if you were to draw these characters up as like D and D characters, mm-hmm. intelligence wise, they're probably not even a ten. They're probably like maybe an eight, maybe even a seven if you really wanted to put that. Um, but I feel like wisdom wise, <laughs> right? They're probably like close to like a sixteen, seventeen because sure. they're able to convince like everybody, like everybody's for uh, is for it, and they're like. They're like they use their charm to be like dumb wise by using song lyrics. Sure, I like great wisdom, great charisma. For sure. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's kick this movie off because this movie uh, this is going to be a much longer episode than what we were expecting. Um, we are taking this back all the way back to February seventeenth, nineteen eighty nine, with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, of course, starring Keanu Reeves, Alex Winter, and. Uh, George uh, George Carlin as well. Oh yeah, um, legendary. This movie opened up at number two, uh, at number yeah, at number three, and it had to share the box office with like The Burbs, which is not that great. Um, Rain Man, The Fly Two, and the criminally underrated ultimate chick flick movie Beaches. Wow, that movie Beaches is one of those movies that like. That that if you're it has everything a soap opera could basically want in a mm. three hour movie. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, I think out of uh, the list besides Bill and Ted, I'll probably go with Rain Man. Rain Man's pretty cool. I like Rain <laughs> Man. Working Girl's still in there. Obvi- uh, obviously, Mississippi Burning's a really great movie. Uh, I think The Mighty Quinn um, opened up that weekend also. Oh wow! <laughs> so <laughs> this movie kind of kicks off. And it actually kicks off all the way into the future in the year 2688. Very random year here where humanity exists as basically this utopian society due to the inspiration of the music and philosophy of the great ones, Bill S. Preston Esquire and Ted Theodore Logan. Um, Wild Stallions. The Wild Stallions. <laughs> um, one of the citizens, Rufus, is tasked by the leaders to kind of travel back to San Dimas, California, in 1988, using yep. a time machine that's basically shaped like a phone booth. So it's so. I remember when I was reading the notes on this movie. Initially, the the time machine was supposed to be like a '69 Chevy van or something like that. Right. Like it was supposed to be like almost kind of like one of those old Volkswagen vans. But they were like, nah, we don't want to really seem like back to the future, so we're not going to do that. We'll just do a phone booth. And I'm like, right. you guys, we'll gonna... just do Doctor Who, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm like, oh, did you guys forget about Doctor Who? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You just need some sort of iconic to, to be your time machine, you know? It has to be a car. or a fo- like, It has to be something like, you know? Here's what I love about the phone booth like throughout this whole thing they they pack in like 12 10 people. yeah like Easy. there's no way you could like i don't know if anyone remember those phone booths maybe you could get two right people in there <laughs> um at like one point in this movie you're like seeing uh, what do they call it the links of time or something like that where you're circuits of time the circuits of time right and nobody's in the phone booth. They're they're on top of the phone booth. They're writing on top like and stuff. Sticking out like no problem. And I'm like, I'm like, how? What? How, how is this not affecting people? How are you? Right. Not- <laughs> Seems dangerous. What if you just fell out? But I don't know. The the, the rules are really loose. With the time travel in this movie. Um. So yeah, we get that you know, opening kind of monologue from George Carlin. And then the movie opens with Bill and Ted, like in their history class. And you can tell that they are like, just dumb brain dead. And it's funny because it's like, it doesn't even seem like it's especially them because it's just like everybody in this movie you see besides like the adults or the parents are all just kind of like California mall walkers, surfer types, you know, um, They're definitely like, uh, 
they're they're basically zombies, you know. Right. <laughs> Everyone's just kind of walking around and just. They're all hot idiots. <laughs> exactly. Um, and while they're 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 dim witted, like uh, like the the teacher. The teacher kind of pulls them aside to basically like say, "You guys really need to like knock out this history exam because you guys are fucking idiots, basically." Yeah. And and if you don't do this, which again. I, I'm a little curious. What is with this town and doing like history presentations in a theater in front of everybody? Yeah, it's crazy. The uh, I guess the wealth of the '80s, you know. Right. <laughs> and like people are excited about these history, you know, tests. And I'm like, I'm like, are they? Is somebody really sitting there thinking, man, I really want to hear about Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, they're super excited, times. man. I guess all you can do is go to the movies, go to a, the water park, and you just get super excited about uh, the Battle of the Bands and uh, <laughs> just the, your history report. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh. Uh, should they fail Ted's father, uh, who is played by, oh, God, I've seen him in everything. Um Hal, uh, uh, Hal Landon Jr. Yeah. Um, who is a police captain. Who, who is police captain Logan. He kind of plans to ship Ted to a military academy, which was initially known as the Oates Military Academy. Yeah. In, in Alaska. And then they just called it the Alaskan Military Academy based upon, I guess, General Oates, whoever that guy is. Yeah. Uh, and the idea would then be that it would end Bill and Ted's fledging band, the, uh, the wild silence and alternate history. Yeah. So, but when they get back, we get the introduction to who is probably going to be my that chick award. <laughs> the mom. Oh, Missy. <laughs> <laughs> because this is like this person that's just like that. You know what? Everything about her is just like you would think that she would be like snobby to these boys. She's actually really nice to them. Oh yeah, like very, like most of the actual people uh, are super. Like everyone in this town's like nice. The only people that's like pissed off is like Ted's dad. Right. Uh, There's no bullies to these guys because nobody can imagine being a bully to these guys. So yeah, Missy's deal is that um, she was what a senior when they were either freshmen or sophomores yeah when they were freshmen and then she marries bill's dad in the the first movie um so she's only like a couple years like older than them right played by bernie casey yeah so they're you know he's like oh your mom's hot and he's like shut up ted and it's like yeah they're (laughs) They literally were, you know, like at school at the same time. So. Right. And, and they're trying to study for this test. And here's the one scene that, that kind of like, like when I was watching actually adventure again, I kind of got like weirded out a little bit. But like, <laughs> like Missy comes in and she like brings sandwiches. I'm assuming they're grilled cheese. Yeah. Right? Cause they look really toasted. They're burnt. Right. They were super toasted. Like, yeah. Maybe she doesn't have her cooking clothes. And no one cares. Nobody cares, right? Yeah. So she brings she brings some grilled cheese, and then the the father kind of comes in, and and uh, you know he he was like, "Why don't you guys go study like somewhere else?" I'm like, "They're in. That's Bill's bedroom. What are you doing?" Yeah. <laughs> like, and then I love the fact that Ted actually said something about that. He's like, he's like, "Yo." <laughs> <laughs> they're totally going to do it in your bedroom, Bill. Yeah. Look, <laughs> Ted. I'm sure. like, I'm like, I'm like, but it makes sense. Like I would be weirded out if my, if my parents decided to just have sex on my bed. Right. For the sake of having sex on my bed. Sure. And they kicked you out of your room for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they go to the circle K for like a dinner break. And that's when they are introduced to Rufus and their future selves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Rufus pretty much says, hey, I'm here to help you. Um, actually, wait. They made... straight, who's played very straight by George Carlin, which, yeah. which I think really helped his career. 
Uh-huh. Um, because Carlin, not that Carlin was ever like o- overly wacky. He's right. just, he's usually the kind of comedian that like hits a point, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, this is the point I'm trying to make. And then you're just kind of like, whatever. But he wasn't yeah. overly goofy, you know. So for him to play, play it kind of straight, like you can see him like getting roles afterwards. Because yeah, it's interesting because, you know, if you're familiar with his stand up, it's, you know, sure. it's very raunchy. There's a lot of swearing, you know, there's an intellectual bent, there's a dark bent to it. But usually when you see him in movies, he plays it pretty straight, usually pretty clean, you know. Right. And you could say the same thing of Rufus in both these movies. And I love, first of all, I love that Ted is literally going and he's like asking people questions about history. Like, yeah. oh, when did uh, when did Marco Polo go selling? And like, then like it was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that lady said 1275. Right. And like asking our lady, hey, when did the Mongols like invade China? She was like, I don't know, I work here. Yeah. Like, I'm like, man, people are like kind of super helpful, but not at the same time. That's why I love about this movie. It's, it's, Nobody is overly serious in this movie, and I and I just love that. Um, yeah, get the classic lines with this uh, with Keanu going straight. Bill, strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Yes, phone booth kind of comes down, and of course, and they play this game pretty often in both movies where they say um, they're able to convince their earlier. So basically, the 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 future selves of them. Are trying to convince uh, themselves that uh, the, their past selves that Rufus can be trusted, and they uh, they do it by uh, saying, "If if you're me, what is the number that both of us are thinking of right now?" Yeah. Sixty nine, dude. <laughs> yeah. Nine, dude. Yeah. Whoa. So they decide to trust him. Um, Ted tells himself to wind his watch, right? Uh, Because he always forgets to do it. And then Rufus takes them to show him how the the phone booth works. He takes them back uh, to France. And they see, like, Napoleon invading. Um, 1805, all the way back to Napoleon Bonaparte. Which, I can't say I, I neither cared for Napoleon. Because he's just, like, this brat. He's like an old yeah. brat. Yeah, he's just a kind of a douchebag. Right. <laughs> uh, most of the movie. At, at the same time, I can't really say that the movie neither helps or is hurt by his performance. But like things that you would do is like is like they get the Ziki the Ziki piggy pie. Yeah, the the yeah, big super ice cream sundae. Right, it's like an ice cream. It's like this big, it's like at least twenty scoops to this thing. Yeah. And you could tell he pretty much ate most of it. You yeah. Know? Right. Cheating at uh, cheating at uh, uh, bowling, and then also uh, uh, like grabbing kids from the water slide at Waterloo, of course. Yeah, water the Waterloo, uh, <laughs> and like putting it back. Perfect. I don't know. It's not that I didn't like him. It's just uh, it's just I don't know. I it, it was kind of like it kind of did nothing for me because it just felt like a nerd deterrent. Yeah, I think that's something about this movie because a lot of what it is, I mean, besides a, a few bits of kind of some good backgrounds and some of the like, uh, like visual tech stuff, a lot of the premise of this movie is just kind of like people in goofy outfits that kind of look like a historical figure either just speaking like uh, like German or French or something and just running around doing weird stuff. They go to they go to Austria way more many times than I expected them to go to Austria. Yeah, they go to Germany a lot. Um, so they go back, they see Napoleon, they decide to leave before Napoleon can blow him over the cannon and, and he accidentally gets sucked into like the time hole. Yeah, because he's thrown by the cannonball explosion into their wake. Right. And, and, thrown into there go ahead right so essentially when they come out and they realize napoleon's there they get a plan for their uh their uh, audio report that they'll just go back in time grab a bunch of historical figures from the era that they're supposed to cover in their test and just bring them back and have them talk which is 
a pretty decent plan, right? Sure. Um, they, they don't really have to learn anything, and they're still going to, you know, do pretty well. Right. So uh, after they leave Napoleon with Ted's brother, Deacon. pretty much say don't, yeah, Deacon, and they say don't lose him. Right. So they go back, they grab Billy the kid, they kind of go get in a like saloon fight, go on a kind of yeah. little mini I adventure. I like the Billy the kid thing though, because it was yeah. like, all right, you know, what are you going to do? And and first of all, I love that nobody questions their outfits because right. they very clearly dress 1991. Yeah, you know, like they had uh, uh, the vest over the sweater. You know, with baggy pants and like, oh, yeah. the, or the turned around baseball cap with like the, Sweat. yeah, yeah, like your flannel shirt and your sweat or your, you know, like your sweatshirt tied around your waist. And yeah, it's super nineties. Right, it's incredibly nineties. So yeah. when they get Billy the kid, you know, with Billy, they they basically say he was like, I need two men, and it's like they're doing like a poker game, and yeah. they're clearly cheating. <laughs> they're they're clearly clearly cheating and like they start this whole huge like poker brawl yeah the bar fight it's the saloon fight right what i loved is that they're just sitting there during the saloon fight like they're not trying to escape they're just like what's going to happen it's going to happen and so like we might as well just kind of let this happen yeah and, and in neither of the movies do they have any kind of like physical or fighting prowess they're just too chill for actually, any of that <laughs> actually that's a good point because even in the second movie they they only try to to they actually try to strike somebody once and it hurts their hand so the rest of the time they like use the toys or the tools that people give them to kind of do whatever yeah <laughs> so um, go ahead. for it go for it so after billy after billy the kid they they go back all the way back to like ancient uh ancient greece to go get so socrates you know? socrates 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 not, not socrates not socrates, socrates. socrates. to convince and and i actually found this like really interesting to to convince getting um uh socrates to to join them they did what they used to do in ancient Greece, which is they used to have like philosophical debates. So you'd like get the Senate floor mm -hmm. and you'd walk down and then you present a philosophical topic and it's usually debated. Or if there's nobody debating you, they're just kind of like, yeah, no, I totally feel that. So um, to convince, to, to convince uh, so, uh, Socrates, who by the way, does not speak a lick of English, um, they're able to convince him by singing the song dust in the wind yep all we are is dust in the wind and it's like it like blew socrates mind so i'm like sitting there like, <laughs> that always made me interested is like so how loose are these are are these uh timeline this time travel rules because of every because clearly when they get billy the kid everybody sees them disappear in a phone booth yeah, you know, same thing when they go to medieval England. Like, the phone booth is literally taken is literally taken away. So it's like, do nobody like? Does it alter a timeline? Does it change a timeline now? Is it, it chaos theory suddenly? Does no, nope. exist at some point. Look, it doesn't matter. It's not Back to the Future. Right. It's not Avengers Endgame. It's just like, yeah, just go back in time and grab people and. It's fine, <laughs> you know. They doesn't affect the timeline. It seems right. like at all, um, except for when they needed to. Um, so they get uh, Socrates. So Socrates. Back to Socrates. They go back yeah. to 15th century England. Yeah, and they meet the princesses, right? Elizabeth and Joanna. Right. So they go, and you know, because uh, future Ted told present Ted to, you know, give his love to the princesses. So they go and they put on like medieval armor and they kind of storm the castle. They're just dicking around. <laughs> they really are. I love this because they're not being serious about it at all. <laughs> they're just like, they literally, this is a 90 minute movie. They took two minutes to do a sword fight with them in night armor. You're right. Against each other. 
against each other. (laughs) So eventually they get caught in the shenanigans. And the king, the ugly royal dudes, the king uh, decides to put them in an Iron Maiden. And they're like, excellent. And there's like, "Mm, execute them. And they're like, bogus. (laughs) Um, So they're about to get their heads chopped off. And in the like classic executioner, like switcheroo, find out that Billy the Kid and Socrates pose as the executioners and freeze them. They get the time booth back and they take off. Um, okay. And they end up very far into the future. And they discover that the the that, that society in the future is basically based on their uh, in, uh, based on their influence. Yeah, and, there's awesome music playing. Everyone's futuristic and wearing sunglasses. They have floaty chairs. Right. Um, you know, and after you know, telling them to be excellent to each other, to party on, they they get in the time machine and they go back. To basically um, get extra credit, because at this point, if you really think about it, they already have three historical figures. Yeah, they're pretty good. Like, like you don't you don't really need anybody else outside of what you you've currently got. Yeah. Um, so we get so we get kind of like this sort of jump cut <laughs> kind of montage scene as they're it just abducting. Montage. Yeah, because they abduct like Sigmund Freud, then Beethoven, and like Joan of Arc. Genghis Khan uh, and Genghis Khan, Lincoln. Abe Lincoln. Um, is that everyone? I think that's everyone. Yeah, that is everybody. So essentially they get to the future and they take everybody to the mall so they can figure out how San Dimas is in the future because that's literally, you know, what would these historical figures think of San Dimas in the present day? Right. So they take them to the mall while they go find Napoleon who's been getting into a whole bunch of shenanigans at this point, you know, with uh, Ted's brother, De- uh, Deacon, right? Going to the bowl, all the stuff he said. So they ditch him because Napoleon's a dickweed. And then, so they try to figure out where would Napoleon be in modern day? Waterloo, the water park. So he goes in goes down on the slides he loves it so he's just running around the water park acting a fool and eventually bill and ted find him you know he's he's letting them know how great it is and he's you know they're dragging him away and he's like pitching a fit um so essentially at that point they have napoleon back but they lost everyone else because everyone else um sort of loses it inside this mall and all get arrested. Right. And, and I love how everybody kind of gets arrested because it's like, first of all, Ludwig van Beethoven is like, is like playing the shit out of a piano and having a synth wave machine kind of going at the same time. Yeah. Joan it's like Arc, nine keyboards stacked on each other. Right. Joan of Arc loses all of her like armor and starts doing aerobic classes. Yeah. Um, Abe Lincoln, you know, is just like, well, you don't understand. I am Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And the best is Genghis Khan. Yeah. <laughs> because Khan goes, <laughs> Khan goes and he kind of goes insane with a, with a, like a club or baseball. Well, he, he has a club and he replaces it with like a Louisville's, like an aluminum bat, right? Right. And he's like, oh, this is way better. So he just starts destroying mannequins. And he's like riding a skateboard, flipping over dudes, <laughs> knocking people down and shit. So everybody gets arrested for right. some reason or another. And this is probably where the the, the part of the movie where where they, they kinda where they execute the time plan, you know, kinda makes me laugh because I because I look at like Avengers Endgame and I'm like I'm like, man. If you guys could have just utilize this time machine just like this, everything would have been so much easier. Probably not. Oh, yeah. Because they basically execute uh, an escape plan to get everybody out of prison based on using the time machine in the future to set up what they need in the present. So stuff like a trash can on top of their dad, a tape recorder to like 
lure the dad away right. to the jail cell. Right. The keys that he's that's been missing for two days. Right. So a, a real quick uh, shout out. So like, there is a scene in the movie that makes me feel like, like this literally inspired kind of the uh, escape in the office from the ma- or, um, from the agents in the Matrix, right? Because they go and they're behind a desk and there's literally like a typed out message from them to them, right? right. And literally it tells them like as they read it to duck. So they like duck behind the desk as a cop walks by. Right. Very sort of Morpheus saying to Neo, like, <laughs> you can't convince me that's not what that is. <laughs> um, of course, the escape plan goes uh, wonderfully. Um, they get all the historical figures uh, recollected, and the two basically give this awesome presentation to the school, which is a huge, huge, huge success, and of course allows them to pass the course. I mean, this, this presentation... It, even though it's a history pay for a presentation, it is kind of cool to hear like Abraham Lincoln speak. I just, I love the fact that either the people of San Dimas is just like really cool with everything. Right. Okay? Like time travel, you literally brought in what looks like an actor or that looks like Abraham Lincoln. This guy is really kind of nailing the Abraham Lincoln part though. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, like even if they just rented a bunch of actors to, to like, just do like a performance the way they have it like that seems like that would be worth a nay right uh, you know and obviously even though they don't want to play their instruments they seem like they have some pretty good audio you know visual like technical kind of stage skills because they you know they set up all these spotlights and you know they have music playing and shit and yeah. all these displays are doing war games with napoleon and they're doing sword fighting they so- find a a, a naganata for Genghis Khan to whip around and everything. So it's like, I want to, I want to talk about the Napoleon thing real quick because um, he, 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 he like mentions like water slides. I don't know if you realize this, but the plan he's literally showing in the background, mm. that was his plan to invade Russia. No, that was, that was legitimate. His actual battle plans to invade Russia. And so when Bill, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work, dude. Work. <laughs> he gets, like, yeah. all pissed off at him. Like, it's right. like, okay, like, like he's just called you out on your own shit on that. <laughs> right. They're, like, dumb, but weirdly wise. Like, that's that's something that's weird about the, the these movies, right? Because they are not, like, bright, but they seem to just know shit. Like, stuff that you'd only know if you read books. <laughs> Um, um, it's just, I don't know. It's hilarious. Especially considering that the budget for this film was only like six and a half million and for them to turn around like a $40 million profit off of this. Um, I think it's kind of, kind of remarkable when uh, this movie wraps itself up kind of neatly, uh, with, uh, sometime later, Rufus returns to Bill and Ted presenting them with the two princesses. Princesses. Um, uh, before uh, before they were committed to the prearranged marriages, noting that the women will also be part of the Wild Stallions. Rufus asked to join the group as they play, and he does like this really awesome shredding of the guitar. Um, but upon hearing how terrible Bill and Ted really are at the guitar, uh, Rufus breaks the fourth ball and he says, they do get better. Yeah. That's how the movie ends. And that is the first of this double feature, Bill and Ted, Excellent Adventure. Before we get into everything, um, I want to ask a couple questions to you that I, I kind of skipped around on. I kind of skipped around on this. Um, mainly, I skipped around on this mainly because it, it was, uh, I, I wanted a slight uh, change, uh, change to this. And one of the things I didn't even ever cover was uh, the Rotten Tomato score. Yeah. So what do you think the critic score for this is? is? Ooh. Um, critic score, let's say like 50s. Okay. What do you yeah. think the audience score is? Like 80. 
Okay. Critic score eighty percent. Wow. Audience is seventy five. Critics get it right for I don't, Do you agree with either one of those scores? You know what? I mean, I feel like the on score could be a little higher, but yeah, I mean, look, uh, is it a perfectly executed movie? No, but it's fun. There's totally scenes that stick out. Like, I remember this movie from being a kid. I loved it. Like, I love the whole, just the end. Like, for me, that iconic scene is just that in the, the presentation at the end. You know okay. what I mean? Like, I love watching that over and over to this day, straight okay. up. So let's get into that. Let's get into some takeaways uh, uh, to wrap uh, to wrap this movie up and to jump into our next one. Uh, who is actually going to get your That Guy Award? That guy? Um, hmm. I'm going to give it to Rufus. That's a solid pick. I, I was kind of leaning that way also. Especially because he's more prominent in this one than he is in Bogus Journey. Yeah, I mean... There is kind of like a theme where you see him at the beginning at the end of both movies, but it feels a little bit more weightier in this movie. Sure. Uh, who's getting your That Trick Award? You know, I'm going to give it to Joan of Arc. <laughs> you know what? There was something really, really like cute about her. Yeah. She is just cute and she has a sword. She kicks buns. <laughs> I love The Messenger, that movie, so let's just say John of Arc. Uh, that Fool Award. Ooh, um... I guess Napoleon, right? Yeah. I mean... With you. Like, it just... It's not even, like... There's no antagonist in this movie. There's, yeah. like, nobody that's trying to stop them. It's just, like, this race against time, really. Um, but, man, Napoleon acting like a fool just, like, drove me nuts. Um... Go ahead. Uh, who's getting your uh, cut that out? Is there anything you cut out in this movie? Would I what would I cut out? And <sighs> see, this movie does have uh, a bunch of little weird fillers here and there. Like one of the plot issues is that the time booth is kind of messed up or broken, right? Right. And really, really, what it boils down is there's like a scene where they're all chewing gum, so yeah. Bill can fix. Uh, the antenna that broke off, like, <laughs> doesn't really add anything for the story. Doesn't really add a kind of like any dra- dramatic weight or anything. I don't know. No, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, does this movie hold up? Uh, closing in on thirty-one years. Uh, I would say yeah. I mean, again, it's fun. I mean, uh, I love the characters. Bill and Ted—they're just iconic and stuff. And iconic thing, I know you said it already, but go ahead. Yeah. All right. Yeah, definitely it's the presentation at the end. That's sort of the, uh, I don't know. It's everything that's culminating to, and it's like the most entertaining part, you know? Kind of the money shot, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, you get to see all of the sort of talents of all of the, the, the historical <laughs> famous dudes, right? Everything that they're good at, you know, like Abe or, or Tate's, you know, he, he tells a speech. Sigmund Freud, like, psychoanalyzes, like, Ted on the thing. His dad's watching, and he just, he's like, whoa. Whoa. (laughs) Um, All right, so uh, I'll I'll go ahead and go. Uh, My That Guy Award, I am going to go ahead and give it to, um, man, Rufus is a really good pick. Uh, I'm... It's kind of hard not to give it to Bill and Ted, but mm-hmm. for the sake of separating it out a little bit, um, I'm going to give it to Billy the Kid because Billy, yeah. the Kid, Billy the Kid was kind of like that guy that was like that was like, "Yo, y'all saved my life! Like I'm your boy now." He was down. He's the road dog. Once <laughs> he was like, he was like, "All right, what what time?" Period? After a while, he, he not even after a while, like. As soon as they go back to ancient Greece, he's like, "All right, what what time period are we are we hanging out in?" He's like, "I get this, right? Like, really? Yeah, uh, yeah, whatever. It's it's a Sunday, whatever." It's like your two road dogs really are uh, Billy the Kid and, and Socrates. So much. You know, so. They're just um, into it. Uh, that chick award, I'm gonna give it to Missy. Yeah. Uh, 
because Missy had every reason to be like, like I'm your mom now. Instead, she's kind of they they keep calling her to like do stuff for them, and she's just like okay with it. She's it's into like, it, yeah. Like the only time she even gives any sort of pushback is she's like, "You guys got to do your chores." And Which mine is, is fair. An hour before their presentation, so like everybody chips in, right? Yeah, um, that's a fun scene. It is a fun scene. Uh, that full award, uh, I'm gonna go with you, Napoleon. There's not really anybody else that's really that full. I mean, well, since we picked the same one, I'll give a second one. No, 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 no. In that in that case, in that case, I'll, I'll switch it up then. Um, I know who the other that fool is. Okay, who do you have? It's Ted's dad. Yeah. He's the only other asshole in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> he's just kind of whatever. He, he's just like so determined to get his kid into military school for discipline. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, cut that out. You you brought up a really good one with the bubble gum. There's a part of me that kind of want to cuts out the, the humorous little Missy's about uh, Missy and your dad's about to sleep, uh, sleep with each other in your bed, you know? It, because it, it just it has a hint of creepiness yeah like how horny are you that you can't even just you can't wait you can't go to your bedroom right you can't take the 30 seconds <laughs> to get yourself ready <laughs> um yeah I'll, I'll probably yeah i i would say i would say that like it's not it's not too hard to to uh to believe it is funny i just don't know if it if it's if it fits in this particular movie yeah it hits weird like i understand what they're trying to do but it, it's kind of weird right uh does it hold up absolutely um one thing that i've always loved about the bill and ted movies is that first and foremost they're lighthearted. yeah like they're not to be taken seriously they're not to be taken you know as like this world changing like event bro um they're just they're just movies they're, they're they're movie for the strict purpose of making a movie which is to entertain yeah, so yeah i mean movies. there's stakes because them succeeding is what's gonna save mankind align right. the planets and allow communication with all for life forms right but um, i just you know and 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 that's cool like like i like that stake premise but this is just a movie to make a movie. Like it, it's is, the adventure. It, it, it's it's a journey movie that like it doesn't really need to it doesn't really need to hit hard on you. Mm. But man, you can't you can't help but like laugh at how silly it is. It's kind of like for me it's like it, for me it's like Wayne's World, you know? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Movie, like Wayne's World there's you're you're watching the movie to watch the movie, you know. That's exactly uh, it. Iconic scene, I gotta give it to the uh, Circle K scene because it, it's everything from the phone booth to the conversation between the dudes, you know, with each other. Um, everything about it is just like, it, it, it plays itself so, so like humorous and funny, you know, without, without again, needing anything really special outside of some decently delivered lines and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the final presentation is a good one, but I do think the Circle K scene for me just hits a little, a little harder for me. Um, let's get into some quick hits to kind of wrap up Excellent Adventure. All right. So Alex Winter claimed that he gets two types of letters from teachers, positive ones from history teachers for encouraging students to learn about history and negative ones from English teachers for affecting the way students speak. <laughs> uh, the phone booth time machine was given away as a contest prize by Nintendo Power Magazine while it was promoting the Bill and Ted Excellent Video Game Adventure 1991 game. Not a good game. <laughs> uh, for years, Keanu Reeves lamented that his epitaph would be, here lies Keanu Reeves, he played Ted. Um, in the film, Bill and Ted claim they need Eddie Van Halen and their band to make it better. After the film was released, Eddie jokingly said that he would have joined the band if they had just asked. Yeah. Um, in 2010, the city of San Dimas, California celebrated 50 years of incorporation. The celebration slogan was San Dimas 1960-2010, 
an excellent adventure. Nice. Yeah, I like I like that too. Um, San Dimas football rules. Hmm. Weird. And let's see, I'm going to find one more. Uh, in the original outline for this movie, Rufus was a 28-year-old high school sophomore who befriended Bill and Ted. There's also a character named John the Surf whom Bill and Ted picked up in medieval England. But they decide not to go through with that. Um, and, oh, actually, the, the final one, because I remember reading this earlier. The film was originally going to end with Bill and Ted taking the uh, taking the uh, oh wait, no, no no that's not it. the bar fight scene is parallel to the Girl Scout uh, fight scene in Airplane. Both begin over a poker cheat, which is the extra ace, have the same punches and a bar stool hit, and end with one being slid across bar until breaking through a wall or a jukebox. Nice. Hey, there was someone getting slid across the bar in uh, the replacements last week. Yes, there was. <laughs> All right, on to movie number two. And this is definitely my more favorite of the two. Um, Agreed. Uh, original release date, uh, July 19th, 1991. It shares uh, it shares its uh, weekend opening up against Dutch and Prisoners of the Sun. Uh, but other movies that were actually in during that time, Terminator 2, obviously, 101 Dalmatians. Uh, Boys in the Hood, Regarding Henry, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Point Break, Nick Gun, Two and a Half, City Slickers, like The Rocketeer, Backdraft, Elmo and Louise, and Silence of the Lambs. They were all in the theaters at this time. Oh my gosh. That is a deluge of excellent movies. <laughs> like, like, there's a lot of movies there that I'm like, yeah, we could probably cover that. Yeah, we could probably cover that. Yeah, we could probably cover that. Oh, we could have did Boys in the Boys in the Hood. <laughs> um, when I think about Bogus, when I think about Bogus Journey, um, this movie is everything that the original was not. Where yes. the original, let's 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 kind of face it, like the original is a little safe. There's nothing. Right. There's not a. a um, there's not a, a big antagonist in this movie. Whereas, uh, whereas in Bogus Journey, there definitely is yeah. uh, at least three in, uh, three villains straight up in this movie. Um, yeah, number one is fun but kind of dry. It, it it is a little dry. It, it is a little dry. It, it'd be like it's the six year old version uh, of uh, of Bill and Ted. And what I mean by that is, you ever seen? Okay, you ever seen Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? Mm, yeah. Okay, as an adult, I was laughing very hard at that movie, mm. like way more often than I thought I would. Yeah, when it came out. You could tell that the script was so much lighter that I was kind of like, huh. Like it's why it didn't it didn't do anything for me whatsoever. Right. Um, at least with at least with this. Um, oh my God! Is there no? Rotten Tomatoes for this? What? Bill and Ted, Bogus Journey, Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, so with this particular movie, like, what hits more for me, there we go. What? I am shocked. What are the numbers? Throw them out there. No, I'm going to tell you after. Oh, okay. For me, with this movie, it, it took everything from the original and decided to say, we're going to go big. We're going to go a lot bigger with this. We're going to put a lot of our production budget uh, on onto it. There's a couple of like, there's a couple of, of jokes that kind of kind of fly over everybody's head. Um, but a lot of it is like, we're, we're going to make sure that if you give us a sequel, we're going to do well with the sequel. Right. Um... Whereas the first movie has like a soft sci-fi element to it, definitely. The second movie keeps that, but also adds this like metaphysical element. A little bit, yeah. A lot of bit, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> the original working title for this was actually going to be Bill and Ted Go to Hell. Um, 
and the film soundtrack featured the song Go to Hell by Megadeth, which Dave Mustaine actually wrote for uh, uh, for this film. I don't know if you know that. I did not um, know that. But instead, to kind of to kind of make sure that they still find a way to get kids in there, they decided to call it Bogus Journey instead. I honestly think that's a better name. I, I do. I do. I do also. Um, and this movie really kicks off with the music of Bill and Ted's band, Wild Style, and has created a, a utopian future society. In 2691, mind you, three years after the original movie in terms of where the future part takes place, like everything about this future, like it's so cool. Everybody is dressed so weird. Yes. They're, the, they're in pool noodles. They're pool, pool noodles, their, their clothes glow. And this is way before like Tron two, um. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're just heavy handed with with the time travel now. They're oh yeah, just, they're just grabbing like, people. The, the speaker that I'm bringing in is Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Is Edison's here to kind of talk to you guys about his invention. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Rufus like is the teacher or runs this sort of futuristic music inspired school because like. Even though um, the music of Bill and Ted's inspired the future, now just everything I guess is about music. Um, uh, so uh, he's giving like this lesson, you know, and then our villain kind of shows up, who is played by Joss Acklin, who right. is the, on, from the Mighty Ducks. Yeah, no, or or, or the, the version, the better villain. Yeah. <laughs> Lethal Weapon Two, the the uh, South African diplomat. Diplomatic um, immunity <laughs> just been <laughs> revoked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, he sure. shows up, and he's the like he has some group of people that uh, essentially are like future terror. He's like. He's described as a tyrant in the future, and he's like the one person who hates Bill and Ted, and he has a few followers. So, pretty yeah. much his plan, which I'm not sure if it makes sense, right? Is he goes into, he like, doesn't he show up in a time machine? Right. So, he shows up, they like break through this wall, and yeah. he's kind of like, Shows up uh, going in, uh, going in there. They needed the time machine because they had the time because oh. the phone booth arrived there, right? Oh, I see. Yeah. So I just he like the... he like shows up, and his whole plan is instead of instead of uh, uh, instead of you know like changing something slightly into the future, like I mean, like let's say ten years after Bill and Ted die. You know, right. he just finds a way to change that. His whole plan is to actually go back and kill Bill and Ted. No doubt, right. no problem. Right, like right before I guess they would get, you know, yeah. worldwide fame or whatever. Forget going back in time and just shooting one when they're a kid. Forget you know going back in time and just like destroying the phone booth while they're trapped, uh, like in pre prehistory. So that they can't back go back and do their like report. No, nope. let's go and kill them right now. Now he's not the one that's actually going back though. No, it's instead going to be Automotron versions of Bill and Ted, which are robot versions of Evil Bill and Evil Ted. E evil Bill, uh, Evil Robot Bill and Ted. Yep. Right. Evil Robot Uses. Right. Yeah. And I gotta, I, I gotta admit, I loved them. I love oh. every minute of them. Yes. Because you never get to see Keanu be a jerk in anything. No. And it's... He's a total jerk in this. And, like, you kind of know which, like, at this point, you know what you're in for in this movie. Because, like, at this point, the movie already just goes off the rails in the most, like, awesome way. Right? right. You're just like, what? Yeah, this is the most... <laughs> Right, this is literally like five minutes into this movie because because by the tenth minute is when they actually meet the robots. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like yo, like like this movie is getting ready to like bang out. So, right. So imagine that. All right. So you're you're 
1991, I was like four, right? Right. So and you would have been about six. Yes. Right. So imagine you as a kid, like, oh, cool, new Bill and Ted is is, is coming out, yeah. and you see, and you see how they basically say, you know what? Forget the nice stuff. We're gonna we're we're gonna make you think existential a little bit about this. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the best scenes in the movie. They essentially approach themselves, and they say, "Hey, yeah, where are you from? The future." come with us you have to follow us somewhere and they're like oh you know cool wait how can we trust you you know <laughs> right and so uh of course rufus attempts to stop denomalos but uh seemingly becomes lost to the circuits of time right, right? so several years after their initial adventure the wild silence is basically auditioning for an upcoming battle of the bands and they still suck like like yes. they've had, they've either been goofing off the last three years or so. Um, the girls can play and they can play pretty decently, yeah. Um, but they're 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 completely inept. And despite this, the organizer, Mrs. Wardrow, Wardrow, assures them a slot in the contest as basically the final act where everybody's going to be leaving. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So following a party. Which, by the way, I don't know if you caught kind of the small things with this. And again, this is where the script kind of kind of kicks itself up a notch with this. So one of the things they said is like, uh, is like, well, yeah, I expect she's from medieval, and he like turns away England, and and she's like, what? And he's like, oh, medieval England, like Iowa. Iowa. Like, okay. And then the birthday cake that they're giving to Joanna because it's her birthday is. Her 512th birthday. birthday. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, you know what? That's 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 cute. Like, that's awesome. Like like that that those small little details really work for me. Yeah, I get those time jokes in your, in your time travel movie. Of course. Yeah. So, um, they decide to propose. Uh huh. Right, and they they both successfully they both successfully get engaged uh, in the process. Um, and uh, right as these evil robots arrive from the future, they lure Bill and Ted away, basically stating like, like, hey, we're here to help you out. And at first, because I forgot, I forgot this from like Excellent Adventure that they had already met themselves. I was yeah. like, why don't you trust them. And then I'm like, wait a minute, why wouldn't they trust them? The yeah. last time they met themselves from the future, like they were like, yeah, man, like, like, yeah, well, I'm totally here. Hey, don't forget to wind your watch. Yeah. What? Yeah. Hey, have this have some total character progress. <laughs> right. Have some total, you know, elite, excellent medieval girlfriends. Right. Right. So after luring the real Bill and Ted away to Vasquez Rocks, they proceed to throw them over uh, the side of the cliff is uh, side of the cliff, and the robots basically begin to work to ruin the duo's eventual fame, along with their relationships with their with their fiance. And that's kind of yeah. sugar. That's kind of that's kind of glossing over a lot. Like, like yeah, it, all, you could go ahead. No, it just trips me out that in sort of like this light, you know, because it's called the bogus uh, journey. It's like. Yeah, we're like, you know, 15, 20 minutes in, and we literally see the heroes of our story murdered right. by the clones of themselves by being thrown from like a hundred foot fall or something. Right. <laughs> like, that's pretty dark. <laughs> like, like, okay, like that just happened. And then meanwhile, their plan, like, it starts, it starts really kind of getting dark a little bit. Yeah. Because first they they basically like try to make a move on on the princesses, and then uh, and uh, you know they weren't feeling it. So I don't know if they've never sealed that deal yet, but right. basically they weren't feeling it. So I'm like, okay, which actually actually it does make sense because they're from the 15th century, right? Right. They're from. So, the 15th and if they're princesses century. to be considered queen, you have to actually give yourself up on the night of your marriage. Sure. And, you know, they, these guys don't seem like they're super aggressive in that way. <laughs> yeah. So, eventually, so, they, they break up, right? Yeah. They're like, you don't expect this at, at, at the Bantam. And they're like, all right, later. Yeah. It's just like, 
I guess that's that. They're like, <laughs> they're like, peace out. Yeah. And so at that point, they're just kind of like, they're just kind of fucking shit up in Bill and Ted's apartment. Yeah, they're just thrashing their their place. Meanwhile, Bill and Ted are in the afterlife, which yeah. which is such a great concept because I'm like I'm like you know what if you're going you how do you beat time travel? Well, you have to go into a different plane of existence. Basically. Yeah, they're like in the shadow realm. They're in pretty much. or limbo or whatever <laughs> you want to call it. In the afterlife, their souls are met by death who says they may challenge him in a game for their souls, but warns that nobody has ever won. To escape death, they do what's called melvining him. Yeah, they give him like a super wedgie. They give him a super wedgie. They give death a super wedgie and are unsuccessful at alerting the police uh, through possession of uh, uh, Ted's dad and deputy, which is... Again, a really enjoyable scene because it's just like all the set because you get to see like the actor who was playing like straight as an arrow. Yeah. All of them have to act like Teddy's just like, whoa, I'm like, I'm me. I'm I'm here. Yeah. And it's just been my son has just been murdered. <laughs> right. In this movie series about uh like a garage band that goes in time <laughs> to to ensure their future. Now we have these ghosts possessing uh your own dad um meanwhile meanwhile in the process they actually uh they said well if we can't if we can't uh do it that way then we might as well we have to alert somebody so the most common person that we could alert is missy who by the way now has divorced bill's dad and has married ted's That's dad, dad. <laughs> which is weird and right. Bill's dad looks like shit. <laughs> yeah. You get the same actor, but he looks utterly depressed. There's a joke earlier where they're just like, who's she going to marry next, Ted? Right? <laughs> right. And then they're like, and then you could be like your own stepdad. <laughs> so they go to Missy, who's having a seance with a bunch of her friends. Um,. Because I guess she would get into like new age mysticism or whatever. Sure, That's yeah. the next step for this. That's her natural progression. Yeah, yeah. Look, she's, she, she's dating much older and marrying much older men. Yeah. So her natural progression is to, you know, naturally progress to uh, to uh, something more older, which is dead people. Ooh, crystals. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're holding a seance, and coincidentally, Bill and Ted show up. And are you know divine summoned whatever, and they're pretty much screaming about saving the princesses, and you know, so they take this as like an evil spirit, right? And they banish them, which sends which, their souls to hell. Which where do you get banished? You always yeah. go to hell, All right? So here's what I love about this: so they've literally at least introduced purgatory. Mm -hmm. or limbo whichever one you want to call that version right mm -hmm. and now they're in the plane of hell and this is why this is why i really love this movie is because they have no problem whatsoever like like of course uh, of course they, they they don't want to get into the commentary of it right so they're like uh they're like hey how do we get <laughs> how do we get the the devil's attention the devil's side ah, bro yeah man <laughs> gets his attention <laughs> yeah. and the devil like of course lies to them and they basically get dropped down mm -hmm. into uh into a tunnel and what this tunnel this uh, represents itself as is the personal hells of both of them shared together and then they're each individual hells yeah so they, they get dropped in some sort of weird hellraiser suspended metal box above the lake of fire and yeah each room is an individual thing right so their collective hell is that they are at the oats military academy right and, this is know, this is expressionist personal hell at its yeah. best, which is which is really great so so they get they get general oats general oats comes up and he is hard nosing drill sergeant his ass and, uh, into these guys. Right. You know, 
just like drop down and get me infinity. He's yeah. like, I don't, I don't know if I can do infinity, bro. Right. Um, and they find a way to basically escape that. And they said, maybe we should split up. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, please, please split up. Please split up because I want to see what's next. So, <laughs> oh, we have a newcomer into the party. A wandering cat appears. <laughs> and Bill's personal health is the creepiest of the two of them, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, definitely. Ted's, Ted's is pretty bad. Ted pictures himself as a, a little boy who has stolen Deacon's basket, Easter Bunny basket. Yeah. And there's like this evil Easter Bunny that's like, that's like you need to like, he, you need to apologize for stealing Deacon's Easter basket. Yeah. Bill's is terrifying. Because oh Bill is literally like surrounded by the family table, right? And he's there, and they're all like, "Why don't you give Grandma a kiss, just one little kiss?" And I don't. The best way I could describe the grandmother is that it, it, it's the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. <laughs> <laughs> So what's awesome about that is the grandmother's actually also is played by Alex Winter. So essentially we have an act like a younger actor who's portraying, you know, Bill while Bill is actually dressed as his like gross grandmother trying to run him down and give him a kiss. Right. (laughs) And, and, they eventually kind of get like corner, like a tri corner, basically, yeah. and uh, they say that we need to play, we need to play, we, we need to take the devil's offer. Yeah, or, or we need to take death's offer, not not the devil, but the uh, but death's offer. Yeah, we because have to play death to, to to get out. You have to be in the game. Here's why I love this uh, this movie because this is a, a complete parody out of an amazing, amazing 1950s movie called The Seventh Sign, yeah. which the whole point of it is in the seventh sign, which the actor recently passed, actually. Um, It's a knight who, to save his life, has to play a game of chess against death. Yeah. Instead, in this one, they parody it to basically say, oh, no, it's not going to be chess. No, it's going to be stuff like Battleship. (laughs) Yeah, they do what? Battleship, Clue. They do Clue. They do Twister. they do Twister as the final one, and they do uh, um, Electric Football. The, oh yeah, Electric Football is the third one. Yeah, and um, and you know with the with Twist with Twister, I can't I can't stop laughing because the guy who's playing Death is William is William Sadler, right? Billy from the Karate Kid. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, sweep the leg, Billy. You know that's him, right. Johnny. Or Johnny. No, no, I'm said, I'm said Billy. It's Johnny. It's Johnny from Karate Kid. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. William Sadler is Johnny from Karate Kid. Okay. <laughs> so, so when he goes to, like, stretch out, he's in a complicated crab maneuver. When he goes to stretch out to put right foot green, he gets it initially, <laughs> but it looks so painful. Like, yeah. like seeing this stretch, I'm like, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what somebody did to you, William Sadler, but this is very sad for you. <laughs> like, like, please make this stop. Yeah, um, like, um, I mean, it must be that robe restricting his movement. Yeah. So, <laughs> so of course, afterwards. Uh, See now you're making me guess myself if I if that is. Oh, no, I'm looking. <laughs> Am I wrong? It's like I remember only because like I remember watching Cobra Kai. I think it's a different guy. I know he's. I know William Sadler's in a bunch of other movies though. Uh. Oh, it's William Zapka. Yeah. Okay. There it is. My bad. Okay, I'm wrong. My bad. Uh, I guess we get that that out. We're not going. So, I'll leave it in. It's fine. So, <laughs> okay, you beat. Uh, okay, you beat me. You know, William Sadler says, 
Uh, because death is beaten every time, in the end, he reluctantly admits defeat and places himself at Bill and Ted's command. Yeah. Realizing they basically need to, they basically need to locate the smartest person in the universe to help build counter robots to counter Denomalos' evil robots. So, right. Well, wait, let's, let's back up here for a second, right? Because this is something I never, because like, not only does he let them back to life, right? But like you said, he's like, I am at your service, right? So at this point, he's like their, he's like their little bitch, essentially, right? So Pretty it's much. Like, Pretty it's, much. They command like, death. Like, yeah, is Bill and Ted like immortal? Because they, you know, like he, they die and it's like, bring me back. Also, can they just kill, like, I don't know if they thought this one out because they're dumb, but it's like, if death has to do what they want, can't death just like Touch the numbers. Yeah, just touch a death anybody. Right. So, to <laughs> do this plan, this little bit more complex plan, uh, they uh, they're escorted to heaven. Yeah. And when they're escorted to heaven, they realize they don't have like an invitation to heaven. <laughs> which yeah. I don't, I don't know how you would get one. Um, so they decide to call over three people who do have an invitation to heaven. Whoop the shit out of them, mug them, right. and, and proceed to walk into heaven. So, you've mugged somebody to walk into heaven. Get into heaven. Point. And it, it's it's amazing. So so they go, they get into the line to uh, to go meet God. Right. Yeah, have an audience. I like ask him a question, like, "What is the meaning of life?" And they straight up quote. Every rose has a thorn, just like yeah. every... <laughs> and just kind of doing that. And the guy's just like, okay, whatever. Like, right. he just kind of like passes him on. I don't know if that was Peter, but like he just like passes him on to God. Dude, just all the wisdom, right? They right. just. And I really love this scene with God because, of course, God God knows, right? Because yeah. he's just like, okay, like what the fuck, and. uh and you never see him, but but you know uh, he's just that point. He's just that big bright light, it's right? Like, and they're like they're like uh, first of all, uh, first of all, God, congratulations on Earth, like <laughs> it, it's righteous, you know, yeah. <laughs> like uh, Bill and I enjoy ourselves every day that we're there, and then they kind of explain they're like a little bit of a plan, and in the process, they're basically given a map. I think it's a map. Yeah, it's like a map of yeah. heaven or so they're still in heaven it it's like a clear sheet with lines and so it's it's like implied to be some sort of map or yeah and they're directed by god to an alien duo which you've been hearing this this name all through mind you the evil robots have been saying the name too right like station station right station and they're like these I don't know how to consider them. They're, they're trolls. They look yeah. like they're they're basically trolls. Yeah, they're they're trolls with with ET skin, and apparently they're the smartest scientists. The, the smartest scientists in the entire universe. Right. Why they're in heaven, I don't know. So that has to mean that they're either dead or kind of have a free pass to go. Well, in and out. I mean, Bill, or sorry, Bill and Ted. They call them Martians. Right. So. I don't know if the movie's implying and that you hear that there's extraterrestrial life even in the f- end of the first movie, right? Right. So it's like, is the implication then that all the Martians died and that's why there's nobody on Mars now and there are Martians that went to heaven? Or are they implying that there are Martians currently on Mars that we haven't found? Right. Or are they just aliens and they call Martians because they don't know where the hell they're from? Right. Again... We don't take. We're not going to take this movie incredibly seriously, obviously. But yeah, it, it, it's a fun ride, no doubt about it. On the eve of the Battle of the Bands, uh, Bill and Ted return to the mortal world, and they race to the concert as Station, as they ba- they basically go into like a hardware store, and Station by using an air duster and like a swing arm lamp. Boards, yeah, you know, it's able to build. These kind of legit looking robots for for 1991. I will right. like, like when I saw them, I was like, you know what? Even nowadays when I watched them today, I was like, you know what? That's not bad. <laughs> Dude, 
Yeah, they're kind of like if Lego and Nintendo got together to make a robot. Right. That's what these robots look like. Right, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so, so elsewhere, Evil Be- Bill and, and Evil Ted abduct Joanna and Elizabeth and tie them above the stage, of course, at the Battle of the Bands, intending to drop them at the finale, right? Yeah. Don't know why that needs to happen. Don't know why you couldn't just kill them at this point. Nobody cares. Like, They're ambiguously is- evil. Right. Bill and Ted arrive, and mind you, when they get kidnapped, again, my girl Missy, like, stands up to Bill and Ted, and Bill just kind of, like, breathes on her, and she passes out. Right. Like, super evil breath. Right, super evil breath. Um, so Bill and Ted arrive just as the evil robots uh, decide to take the stage, and uh, the benevolent robots, like, it's not even a fight. Like, the benevolent robots just kind of, like, march right up and, like, Rock them, sock them, robot them in the head. And yeah, punch them in like the guts and they explode. Like, right. I'm like, okay, like, you like get, how do you get that from an air duster? Like massive overkill. Hey, station. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, as it looks like everything is okay because Joanna and Elizabeth are lowered by station uh, before their ropes break, Denomalos appears in the time booth and is prepared to kill Bill and Ted himself. And again, a fun sequence kind of uh, kind of happens with this whole, like, first of all, he overrides the broadcasting equipment, right? Which yeah. is kind of dope. Like, his gun just goes, and he, like, shoots the camera equipment, and it's like, okay, everybody's getting this now. Nobody can understand English, but right. one Italian guy that's just like, bello, 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 bello. Yeah, they, <laughs> he has that crypt, crypt uh, Tonian technology. Right. That Zod has in Man of Steel, essentially. Pretty much. Pretty much. So Bill and Ted basically deduce that they can go back in time and kind of and kind of wrap themselves up into this uh, following the uh, following the encounter to basically arrange events for Denomalos to be captured in the present. So yeah. it's like stuff like like they they the a sandbag comes from the top and knocks the gun out of the hand and then the in cage, a cage. Down, you know. And then Denomalos is like, ah, but you forget, I also have time travel power, so I have the key, and I have another gun. Yeah, the gun thing is weird to me, because it's not like he just pulls it, like, out of his boot, or, like, (laughs) from behind something. It just appears in his hand. (laughs) (laughs) So. Um, But Bill and Ted then gain the upper hand by explaining that it's only the winners who go, who get to go back. And after Denomalos is distracted by death by being Melvin. Uh, he is arrested by Ted's father, uh, and Mrs. Waldro uh, reveals herself to be a dis- uh, disguised Rufus, who urges him to play. Of course, they're still terrible musicians. So, so Bill and Ted decide to use the time booth and immediately yeah. return to the auditorium with, uh, with their families, which now include Little Bill and Little Ted, right. after spending 16 months of intense guitar training. Now, here's the thing. They already had three years in between, you know, the first and second movie to even get good. Right. right? So what is so what is this hyperbolic time chamber shit, you know, going to suddenly do for them? You know, like, like, I don't know. They also had a two week honeymoon in between there. So it wasn't exactly 16 months. It was 15 months and two weeks. Yeah. I mean, at this point, we're like, let's wrap this up. Right. Sure. <laughs> So joined, so joined by death, and death has a great line. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah. Death, death has the his one great line, and I'm gonna give you. Uh, I'm gonna give you a secret. That line is not originally uh, originally scripted. They took it from the sentence of a serial killer yeah. who's, ga- who's game ready to die. Um, you go ahead and say the line. Oh, yeah. You might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later, you'll dance with the Reaper. That's right. <laughs> and so, and so this movie wraps itself up with uh, the Wild Silence performing a stunning rock ballad, which is, of course, Kiss's version of God Gave, God gave Rock and Roll to you. Right? Yeah. Um, as the worldwide broadcast sent by Denomalos continues, broadcasting their music across the globe and creating harmony. Following their win at the Battle of the Bands, the Wild Silence encounter many perks of fame, and it's a little bit of everything. 
uh, that helped them fulfill their destinies, creating a utopian society with their music, and eventually taking their act to Mars yep. um, in Stallion One. And that's kind of, and that's it. That that's that's Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Oh yeah, it's a definitely. Solid movie. Definitely, it's. I would say number two is my favorite of the of two. two. Yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. Um, let's wrap this thing up so uh, so we can continue. Because uh, uh, I want to discuss very br briefly about face the music, um, uh, so that we can get uh, so that we can kind of get opinions of it. First and foremost, the Rotten Tomato scores for this. Um, since you saw my reaction, what do you think those scores are? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I gotta imagine if it'd probably be lower, right? Yeah. Um, so let's say like forties for the critic score, maybe 60 for the audience score. 54 and 56. All right. Which hmm. I'll be honest, I'm, the a difference. I'm a little surprised by the audience. Yeah. Uh, that, that is weird to me because like, mm, this is, like I remember it's like Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2, right? I always as a kid remember liking Ghostbusters 2 more specifically because they showed it on TV more. Sure. Because I think it was just like a little bit more kid friendly. But this but, is one of those movies yeah, where I, I think so. this is one of those movies where I think number two was a lot better, but maybe it was because it, it is darker. Right. It's inherently a darker movie. It's kind of like the, the Batman Returns. It's funny you mention that because I've seen Ghostbusters 2 a lot. Yeah. Um, my dad loves Ghostbusters 2 more than Ghostbusters 1. And I disagree. Like, I do. Oh, one is the better movie, definitely. One is definitely the better movie of the of yeah. two of them. Right. Like, like but man, like, like just, just to kind of think, uh, just to kind of think that, like, Bogus Journey Bogus Journey for me is is a movie that took a lot of risk in basically everything. Yeah, agreed. Um, it basically said, you know what? Instead of turning this into into another movie where where to fulfill their destiny they have to chase a MacGuffin, instead, why don't we throw an exis existential plane of existence? Right. Uh, let's see what they what they do. Of sure. Course, yeah, they're not going to go too deep into that conversation. I don't want them to. I no. just the fact that they actually did it. You well, know, I, I like the idea too that like, even though the Denomalous thing kind of puts this weird kind of plot hole, because the whole idea is that everyone loves Bill and Ted, right? So number two kind of takes that concept and says, well, there's this one guy who hates them and literally kills them at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> Right. It spends a good chunk of the movie coming back to life in order to like defeat the guy who's essentially responsible for their death. Like, yeah, I mean that's that's just a way better satisfying storyline to me. It was. It was. It, it had. It was literally a journey for me. Yeah. Ninety at ninety minutes for it to be the movie that it came out to be. Um, in my opinion, I, I I don't think there's a lot of flaws with Bogus Journey. No. Yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe trying to explain to somebody what Melvin is, you know, which oh. is okay, fine. You know, that's that's maybe a super '90s thing, but it's like that. That's not that doesn't hurt the story in my eyes. You know, it's like no. it's, okay, it's it's just they '90s their way out of uh, out of the problem. Sure. You know? um, let's get into some takeaways for this, and we're gonna wrap this up, uh, and we'll talk about face of music very briefly. And uh, we'll finish this episode. So, who's getting your that guy award? Ooh, um, station. Is it a guy? Uh, <laughs> sure. N there's no need to gender station. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll, we'll yeah. go ahead and call it that guy. Uh, I know why. the The car station is is weird, but kind of awesome at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's getting your That Chick Award? Ooh, uh, I think it's gonna have to go to, was it, uh, Mrs. Woodlord, you know, Pam Greer. Wardrow, yeah. There you yeah. Go. Cause I'm in, been in love with Pam Greer <coughs> since I was a teenager. So, there you go. <laughs> that Award. Is there really a That Fool in this movie? Uh, 
I'm going to give it to Death because he's just kind of goofy. <laughs> he's a little goofy. I'll say that. Uh, <laughs> cut that out. Uh, I am going to say the... So um, there's like a, a few aside scenes where Denomalos like talks to evil Bill through Ted's eyes and almost it never it's like supposed to be kind of played for as a joke or a little bit funny or just a little bit to advance the plot but it just it does nothing because essentially between evil Bill and Ted killing good Bill and Ted and then them essentially getting killed at the end they do nothing they like they serve no real point to the plot sure yeah um uh does this movie age well yes yes it does absolutely I, I yeah. agree. and iconic scene oh um the death challenge that's god that's really solid too all right <laughs> Uh, that guy award, I'm actually going to go ahead and give this to both Bill and Ted because they, first of all, they, they conquer death. <laughs> yes. Uh, they conquer their own personal hells. Yes. Um, they, uh, uh, they're lovable in this. They're, in my opinion, this is where you really kind of get that lovableness of, of them. Whereas in Excellent Adventure, they're, they're, they're hitting the lines and the, and the lines are hitting just fine. Yeah. It's just the script's a little light. For them to literally see them go through this journey, you're kind of you're really pulling for them after uh, after a little bit. Sure, and also you get good Bill and Ted, and you get evil Bill and Ted. So like, not only get the uh, get to kind of expand their roles as heroes, they get to stretch their legs as douchebags. Right, which is <laughs> which is kind of nice, you know, yeah. it's kind of a nice uh, thing. Um, that chick award, this is. A little difficult because uh, Pam Greer is, is is cool. Um, there's a part of me that really wants to give it back to Missy again. Give it back to Missy. You could. Um, I will give it to the princesses though. Um, yeah. They were given a little bit more to do, and yes. when they're given a little bit more to do, you can kind of tell that they are genuinely. They actually genuinely like Bill and Ted. Right. So, um, they're also not bad. At, they're they're not bad as band players either. So. Um, kudos to both of them uh, uh, for for doing so. Um, that full award, I gotta give it to Denomalos. Yep, he has a really great name. I love that name, Denomalos. But first of all, that name is just Ed Solomon backwards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he's um, a writer in this movie, by the way. Interesting note about Denomalos: he ends up being the third husband of Missy. Of so good for you, man. Like, yeah, because it shows in one of the newspaper reels that uh, Missy marries Dalton. <laughs> so apparently he must get out of jail at some point and just have a normal life. Who knows? Um, or maybe. Uh, I, I got to give it to Denomalos because I feel like, I feel like you, you, you had a good plan, but your execution was a little bit off and you probably should have taken an extra hour to think about your execution like did you really need the evil robot buses or was it instead a little bit better to just go back with that awesome gun of yours you know and just yeah. shoot the, and shoot them yourselves and that's it yeah and also he's one of those guys where his gripe i mean i guess this is the big problem is like we don't get a backstory for him besides the fact that he was Rufus's old teacher or whatever. Uh, old gym teacher. Old oh, was gym. it was a gym teacher? Oh, gym so teacher. he's just a jerk because he's a gym teacher. Sure. Maybe that's supposed to be the thing. But it's like you live in this future where everyone uh parties on and are excellent to each other. So why Right. I miss a good thing, man. And uh cut that out. I'm not gonna cut out anything. Honestly. Play everything. I think the movie is pretty rock solid for 90 minutes. I don't really think there's that many weird like cutaway scenes. You no. bring up a good point on the eyeball on the eyeball thing, um, but at, at the same time, they're, they're, they probably needed something to to show that there's communication going on. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I always try to cut something out, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really cut out anything. Um, no, I really enjoy maybe, this movie. Maybe, maybe James Martin of Faith No More, because I actually don't like that guy. <laughs> oh. Um, do you know he got fired from Faith No More, or uh, uh, because of this movie? I did not know that. Yeah, he got fired because of this movie. Wow. Because he basically recorded without their permission. Jeez. Wow. Um, does it age well? Absolutely. Uh, this is one of those movies that you can kind of go back even 10 years from now and still find something to laugh about. Sure. The concept of going to hell, escaping hell, it's your own personal hell, expressionism. Um, no, it's not explored. I'm okay with it not being fully explored. This is a Bill and Ted movie, yeah. not, a, not, not a Christopher Nolan movie. This sure. isn't something that needs to be fully explored. It just, you know, it's like it's almost like a little wink. Um, yeah, it just adds an extra layer to the universe, right? Sure. Iconic scene. It's really tough not to give it to the personal health because the, those scenes really stick out. Um, I'm actually going to cheat and give it to the ending sequence, like sure. because the song "Look God Gave Rock and Roll to You" is actually pretty decent ballad that never gets played anymore right um, you know it's kind of nice to see that that hey which is why which is why i'm a little curious on how they're going to do face the music a little bit because it's like okay well we didn't have two sons two girls okay that's fine sure. um, you know and and just and just kind of just kind of stuff like that right and, uh, to get there uh let me get into some quick hits so we can wrap this one up the evil character from the future is called Denomlos, which is writer and producer Ed Solomon's name backwards. He <laughs> ha uh, During filming, Keanu Reeves collapsed in his trailer and was hospitalized with an arm infection. Damn. Yep. Uh, Bill and Ted playing a game with death to win back their lives is a reference to the Seventh Seal, 1957. Um, let's see. So the evil, this is pretty interesting. I thought this was cool. The evil robot us's were supposed to kill Bill and Ted at the Battle of the Bands. Mm. On the boys would invoke their wins against death to get resurrected. This part does appear in the comic book adaptation of the movie, which was based on an earlier draft of the script. Wow. Um, in a deleted sequence, which I recommend you checking out, because it's actually pretty decent, the evil robot Usus uses devices to recreate Bill and Ted's personal hell, so Granny Preston, the Easter Bunny, and Colonel Oates, and send them after the heroes. Bill and Ted end up having to face their fears to get rid of them. Bill gives Granny a kiss on the cheek. Ted calls his brother and apologizes for stealing his Easter candy, and both boys treat Oates with kindness and friendship rather than terror. Mm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we already know what that one is. And you know what? I'm going to give one final one. Um, I'm going to give two. First of all, Pam Grier's character's name is, is Mrs. Wardrow. In the first movie, actually, Inventor, two teachers at the History Report are named Mr. Ward and Mrs. Rowe. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'll give you two more also. The songs The Reaper and The Reaper Rap, which can be heard in the closing critic, uh, credits, are performed by Steve Va uh, Vale, who worked with Frank Zappa from 1983. One of Zappa's sons, uh, uh, Dweezil Zappa, actually co-wrote the song Two Heads Are Better Than One, which is played by Power Tool, which appears in the closing credits of Excellent Adventure and as a closing track to the film soundtrack album. Years later, Alex Winter, who claims to be a huge Zappa fan, wrote and directed the documentary Zappa 2020. Wow. And finally, William Sadler reprises his portrayal of the Grim Reaper in the Tales from the Crypt episode, The Assassin. <laughs> I love it. 
Um, so that's Bogus Journey. That's the Bill and Tats. Thank you guys so much for uh, hanging out with us on that. Um, real quick, expectations on Face the Music. Oh man, I just expect it to be awesome. Like, um, I like, like I said, I love both Bill and Ted movies. I mean, I think number two is better than one, so I'm expecting three to be better than all of them. I mean, you know, like, camera has been in tons of things since then. It, it's as much as I love Neo and I love, you know. Uh, John Wick, I would love to see him do like another kind of comedic movie. So I'm just super excited for it. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not going to hold my expectations that high, mainly because uh, uh, I always find that the third movies in most series, not all series, uh -huh. um, usually don't hit up to the sequel's expectations. But, sure. but, but what I do think uh, is going to have it. It's going to be very, a very huge nostalgic trip. You know, you know it is. You know they're probably going to bring back Missy. You know that they're going to find a way to bring back uh, Joanna. Um, and, uh, you know the, the, the princesses. You know that somehow they're going to get. Uh, they're, they're going to make a reference to the to at least Ted's dad. You know, um, yeah. it's going to be. You know, you know there's going to be some way, shape, or form. Rufus is going to be there. Right. And, um, you know, what I what I love what I would love to see is is that all it has to hit is the nostalgic bone for me. Sure. And as long as it hits that, that I'm pretty much going to be happy with it because it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like uh, Super Troopers Two. Mm -hmm. Super Troopers One is a much better movie than Super Troopers Two, but Super Troopers Two has funny. Moments. It's moments. Look, I, I like Super Troopers too. So did I. Like, yeah. I thought the second one. I thought the second one was was very uh, was was decent at least. Yeah. Um, I just really like the first one a lot better. Sure. Um, but yeah, so that's all it has to hit. It just has to hit. It has to hit the notes. It doesn't necessarily need to be this huge like adding another chapter, possibly a number four is coming out. I don't need that. I'm perfectly. I was perfectly happy with Bogus Journey wrapping everything up. Yeah. Perfectly happy with face the music, wrapping things up in a nice little bow and saying goodbye to these characters. Sure. Um, I mean, apparently they've been writing this script for like ever, so <clears throat> right. You know, they have is, time to put the jokes in. And... Right, which is which is awesome. If if that's all if that's all it is, um, the cast is actually pretty impressive. Uh, uh, Samara Weaving is going to be in there. I saw her in uh, Ready or Not. Uh, Kid Cudi is going to be in there. Julian mm. Bell is going to be in there. Um, so they have some people definitely that that could really kind of bring it a little bit. So uh, Anthony Kerrigan, which if you've never seen, uh, uh, oh, what is the name? Barry from HBO. Um, mm. he's in that, and he's so freaking funny in that in that series. Um, but he's supposed to play like the antagonist. Um, so I guess, so I guess we'll kind of see. Um, yeah, this was really enjoyable, man. First double feature. I think we, hey. we load it pretty well. I'm glad they're both 90 minute movies. If there were any longer, we'd still probably be talking. Yeah. <laughs> you got two for me, y'all. <laughs> two. Uh, let the people know where they can find you. Yes. You can find me at Leland Hairston on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find me, um, on Facebook, Leland Harrison. Uh, I uh, do frequent the Bill and Ted uh, group on Facebook, so shout out to all my people there. Definitely. And uh, you can always find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at David Danger Neff or Danger Neff, whichever one you want to look me up as. Uh, of course, please follow uh, Back to the Classics uh, Movie Talk group on Facebook. Uh, as well as the page on Facebook, as well as BTTC Podcast on Instagram uh, as well. Um, it's kind of been a little bit of a, of a transition period for Beat as uh, COVID-19 has kind of kicked our ass a little bit, not even going to lie. Um, shout out to all of our supporters, definitely. You guys, you guys make this uh, well-oiled machine run uh, effectively. Uh, as well as uh, as well as thanks to our pl uh, platforms over at Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and our iHeartRadio. Um, 
that's pretty much it. You know, uh, check out everything, beatnetworkonline.com to kind of see any updates uh, that, uh, that we're going to, uh, to be having in terms of any 20 for 20s uh, that we're having. I know that they're doing a part two this weekend uh, for uh, 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 the live show, the noise live show, fuck out of here or FOH, whichever one you want to call it. Um, so yeah, so follow us on that. Um, thank you guys so much for, for sticking with us. I know this was a little bit longer of an episode than we were expecting, but it's also Bill and Ted, so it's two of my favorite movies. Um, yeah, other than that, thank you guys so much. And uh, we will see you all next week on, unfortunately, Lund's final episode uh, before he goes back into the mystery closet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um uh but thank you guys so much and uh, we'll see y'all next week peace see out next week peace <laughs>